Good evening. I'm James Roth, Deputy Director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. And on behalf of my colleague Stephen Rothstein, Executive Director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, thank you for coming tonight. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters at the Kennedy Library Forum Forums, lead sponsor Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. I'm also delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening, and when Q&A starts, we will invite those of you who are joining us in person tonight to proceed to the microphones in the aisles to ask your questions. There's two aisles right there. In this centennial year, we have been examining and celebrating the many accomplishments and firsts of John F. Kennedy. Tonight is another reminder. President Kennedy was the first president to effectively use the new medium of television to speak directly to the American people. No other president had conducted live televised press conferences without delay or editing. While the public loved John F. Kennedy's press conferences, some of his advisors worried about the risk of mistakes by the president and others thought the press showed insufficient respect for the dignity of his office. <laughs> Indeed. However, by November 1963, President Kennedy had held 64 news conferences, an average of one every 16 days. The first, less than a week after his inauguration, was viewed by an estimated 65 million people. A poll taken in 1961 indicated that 90% of those interviewed had watched at least one of JFK's first three press conferences, and the average audience for all the broadcast conferences was 18 million viewers. Slightly more than we have tonight. <clears throat> President Kennedy helped, uh, helped to significantly enlarge the role of television as a news medium, but he continued to be a voracious consumer of print journalism. During an interview in December of 1962, President Kennedy was asked about his reading habits and the President gave his overall view of the contributions and responsibilities of the press in a free society. Quote, I think it is invaluable. It is never pleasant to be reading things that are not agreeable views, news, but I would say that it is an invaluable arm of the presidency as a check really on what is going on in the administration. There is a terrific disadvantage not having the abrasive quality of the press applied to you daily, to an administration, even though we never like it, and even though we wish they didn't write it, and even though we disapprove, there isn't any doubt that we could not do the job at all in a free society without a very, very active press. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's panelists. Dan Baltz is, she, is chief correspondent at the Washington Post. He joined the paper in 1978 and has been involved in the Post's political coverage as an award-winning reporter or editor throughout his career. Kathleen Hall Jamison is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania's Annenberg School for Communication, the director of the university's Annenberg Public Policy Center, and program director of the Annenberg Retreat at Sunnylands. She is the author or co-author of 15 books and is the co-founder of factcheck.org and its subsidiary site, SciCheck. Tom Nichols is a professor of national security affairs at the U.S. Naval War College, a professor at the Harvard Extension School, and an adjunct professor in the U.S. Air Force School of Strategic Force Studies. He is the author most recently of The Death of Expertise, The Campaign Against Established Knowledge and Why It Matters, and was named one of the 2017 Political 50. I'm also pleased to introduce tonight's moderator. Heather Cox Richardson is a professor of American history at Boston College. Her most recent book is To Make Men Free, A History of the Republican Party. She is currently working on an intellectual history of American politics and a graphic treatment of the Reconstruction era. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Welcome, everybody. It's always a great pleasure to be here at the John F. Kennedy Library. 
And it's especially wonderful to be here today with this particular group of panelists who are just about the top people to talk about the concept of what is real and what is fake in the media today. And I will note that just before we came in today, news broke that the Roy Moore campaign has uh, advised people on the campaign to get rid of comments about um, the accusations against the senatorial hopeful by claiming that the, the people accusing him of um, sexual, sexually assaulting young girls have said that they should simply say that this is the liberal media spreading fake news and has linked them to Breitbart and to Moore himself to refute those things. So it's going to come as a surprise, I think, to a lot of people that this concept of fake news is not necessarily new news. And I'd like to start here with Kathleen and to talk about why you started factcheck.org and why you started it so far back in 2003, which was after all a year before we got that, that quote from Ron Suskind about how the George W. Bush administration said that, we, uh, that, that they were the ones who were living in a, in a reality, uh, whereas they were creating their own reality while the rest of us lived in the reality-based community and they no longer had to live in it. Before, a year before he got that quotation, you started factcheck.org. Can you walk us through why you did that and how you did that? I studied journalism and politics and the intersection between... Is that... Wait a minute. Is that mic on? I can speak really loudly if it's not. One, two, three. No. Okay. So I warned her beforehand that she might have to do an interpretive dance, and I really was kidding. <laughs> It is disconnected, okay. We're going to find the, the intersect point here and we're going to put it back together or not. Meantime, I'm going to speak very loudly. One, two, three. <laughs> there we go. Oh, yes, that is loud. Uh, in the process of studying political campaigns and writing about them, I'd read a lot of journalism in which one side would make a claim, the other side would make a counterclaim, and the journalist would say, he said, she said, as opposed to adjudicating the claims and often, in that exchange, there was a knowable reality. And thought that perhaps the problem that we were experiencing in journalism, and this wasn't all journalism, but enough that it seemed worrisome, was that the world was proceeding too rapidly for reporters who were following the candidates to trust their ability to, in real time, write about things that were contested. And as a result, the default was to, be, to say this and that, and assume that someplace else the public would come to know which of those, if either, or perhaps both, were accurate. And so factcheck.org was an attempt not to speak to the public. We were surprised that you found us, but rather to speak to journalists to say, if we put enough good journalists together, we could perhaps anticipate those exchanges, check them as a good journalist would, and have those checks available for journalists as they wrote in real time in the rapid you know, exchange of political information let, so that we'd be more likely to get it right. Let me ask you this, though. That was 2003. It was. When did you start noticing this? In the 1988 campaign, um, which is when I first started writing about this, because we had exchanges between the Dukakis and Bush campaign about the furlough program in Massachusetts in which the press would not adjudicate the contesting claims, the contested claims. And as a result, the public was left to default to its ideology, to say, well, okay, I'm a Republican, I guess I'll believe the Republicans. I'm a Democrat, I guess I'm going to believe the Democrats, when in fact there was a knowable reality. You should probably walk people through who don't know to what you're referring, what that furlough campaign argument was. The, the you know it, you just might not know yeah. you know it. <clears throat> the charge was that Michael Dukakis, as governor of Massachusetts, had, had sanctioned a furlough program, which in fact was created by his predecessor, a fact conveniently omitted, in which a, an alleged first-degree murderer, allegedly not eligible for parole, had jumped furlough and gone on to commit two horrific acts, rape and an assault of the man who was the, the, um, the other person in the relationship with the woman who was raped. And in that context, a National Security Political Action Committee, an independent expenditure group, put together an ad that had serious inaccuracies about the crime itself. Horton was convicted as an accomplice to a felony murder. He did not himself, as far as the transcripts of the existing court records, suggest that he actually committed the murder, a murder, et cetera. And at the time of the furlough release, he was in fact eligible for parole under the Massachusetts system, et cetera, et cetera. 
But the journalists who are covering it covered either the ad claims as if they were true or the exchange between the two campaigns as if it was assertion, counter-assertion, but didn't look to ask what could we know about the furlough program and that specific crime. The name that you, have, that you went over real quickly is Willie Horton. Those are the Willie Horton ads. So the Willie Horton His real ads... real name was William. <laughs> um, so the, the factcheck.org came that long ago from the 1988 election, which seems very naturally to bring us over here to Dan. You've written about political campaigns very effectively for a very long time. Are we in a different moment, or are they all like this? 1988, Willie Horton ads dropped, as I recall, it dropped Dukakis 16 points in a month in the polls in the summer of 88. Well, we are and we aren't in a different moment. Um, there's been, you know, there have been false claims by candidates for as long as any of us have covered politics. Um, and there have been misleading or distorted political ads for as long as I've covered politics. Um, and I mean, Kathleen is right. When you are in the heat of a campaign, as we were in 88 or, or today, uh, if you're with the candidate, um, particularly back in 88, you had very limited access when you're on the road to try to check in real time um, accusations that are made back and forth. Um, I know we came out of the 88 campaign um, concerned about political advertising in particular, and that was, that was after that was when we began to do much more systematic work of uh, checking advertising. When, when an ad would go on the air, we would, in a sense, fact check that. That was different than what um, Kathleen was doing, but, but of the same idea, which is that there, there needed to be a way to hold politicians more accountable for the things that they said um, in, the, in the course of a campaign. I, I think a couple of things are different today. One is, despite the fact that there are now a proliferation of fact check operations, including one that we have at the Post, uh, I think politicians are more inclined to ignore them and not worry about them than they were when we first started doing this. Well, but, but this, this actually is a wonderful place for, for Tom to jump in, whose last book is on expertise and why people are turning against expertise. And you've linked that to the rise of the entertainment presidency and the rise of the internet. But is that fair to say, do you think? That people, uh, it doesn't matter what people say anymore, what politicians say. I, I think what's even more interesting is, and I should note that I don't represent the views of the Navy here, um, I, I think what's more interesting is not that politicians feel free to ignore fact-checking, it's that voters don't care. Uh, that when something is revealed to be false, voters simply either say, uh, well, I still think it's true anyway, a kind of backfire or a double-down effect, or they say, okay, so he lied. Eh, people lie. Things happen. And they're very cynical about it. So that really lets politicians off the hook. Uh, because at that point, they can pretty much say anything. If it works, it works. If it's discovered to be untrue, well, it, it still kind of works, and they're certainly not held accountable for it. So I, I think part of uh, what I argued um, by doing the research on this book was that, you know, the people in the end that are most responsible for this current state of affairs are us, the, the voters, the electorate. Where do you think that's come from? I think part of it is that we've become so tribal about our politics and so invested uh, in the political parties and uh, figures that we follow that um, we've really, and a word I use very often about this is narcissism, that we have kind of narcissistically imbued all of these leaders and figures uh, with values that we assume to be our own. And so we kind of rule it out as a matter of first principles that they could be lying or that they're bad people or that they're saying something that uh, couldn't be believed. I mean, you're seeing this right now. And, in Alabama, people saying, well, I just don't believe it. It's, that's all there is to it. I've already made up my mind. Uh, and I think, the, to me, uh, my, my background is in Russian affairs. So to me, fake news has a very specific meaning as a kind of whole cloth, has, has a whole cloth lie. Fake news, you know, I'm old enough to say Soviet affairs, so fake news is old news to me. Um, but I think what's uh, even more interesting about this is that people kind of don't care if it's, it's fake. It's, they're not looking for real information. They're looking for confirmation of what they already believe. So here's what I'd like you three to, to address then. If this is the case, and I don't think there's going to be a lot of complaint that Tom is incorrect about that, where did it come from? If we were seeing it as far back as 1988, and I would argue from before that, um, why now? How did we get to this point? 
Well, we got to this point because the country has been coming apart politically. But how and why? <laughs> well, that's that's a very long that's a very long discussion. Give us the haiku. Um, <laughs> I think because the um, the polarization that has taken place is a function of a country that's going through a very big transition or transformation, whether it's demographic, whether it's economic, whether it's technological, cultural. There are, there are some very big changes that we are all experiencing. There's a part of the country that's quite comfortable with that, who sees these changes as good and healthy. Uh, there's a part of the country um, that is either fearful of this, feels they are being left behind by this, uh, objects to it, thinks that the America that they think is great uh, is, is, is being eroded dramatically. Um, there's not much middle ground between those two views. Um, and the political parties have seized on those two views um, and act accordingly. And as a result of that, people now make their decisions about what they think about facts or events based on their, as Tom said, their tribal allegiance rather than their own kind of independent analysis of events and facts and then a choice as to which party they go to. So I think that that, that has created the division. Okay, this is really helpful because this suggests that what we are in is a fairly, I hate to say normal, but a fairly common response to times of extraordinary economic, social, technological upheaval, a demographic upheaval. And that makes sense historically, right? So when those things happen, when you get a real period of instability, you often get the rise of politicians rising to power by d dividing people into tribes. And we've seen this forever. I mean, people have theorized about it since the 1950s. So what that says is that you have, in a period of great upheaval, individuals who come in and garner power by convincing you to hate the other, who are the ones who have taken away from you your, the, 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 the place you used to have in society. That works, except I'm going to throw something else at you now. And I, I know Kathleen doesn't want to hear it, but she's going to anyway. There was a study that came out on December 5th from the Columbia Journalism Review about the last election. And the, that article suggested that the problem was not fake news in the election of 2016. The problem was mainstream news, which in fact um, had privileged a certain narrative by the way it presented the issues in the 2016 election. For example, out of 150 front page New York Times articles, in the last three months of the 2016 campaign, only five of the 150 front page stories uh, compared policies. Um, only 10 had any policy detail at all. That is 150 stories on the election, only five of them had policies. And in six days, the New York Times ran as many front page email stories about Hillary Clinton as they did policy articles in the previous 69 days and in the six days from October 29th to November 3rd, that's five days before the election, the New York Times ran 10 front page stories about Hillary Clinton's emails. That's as much time as they spent on policy in the previous 69 days. And Nate Silver at 538 said that that tipped the election, of course. Uh, of the 1,433 stories about Clinton and Trump, in the Times, 291 of them were about the scandals, only 70 of them mentioned policies. And what that article suggested in the Columbia Journalism Review was that what was more important for mainstream newspapers, and they used the New York Times as a whipping boy in that, of course, is that uh, they were playing to the idea of a horse race versus policies. And they thought that uh, the, the article suggested that the reporters at the Times and at other mainstream newspapers assumed that Clinton was going to win and were trying to keep themselves viable as critics of a new Clinton administration. And so they tried to take an anti-Clinton stance. But at the end, that journalism story, that, re that story in the Journalism Review, blames mainstream newspapers, not what they called fake media, which they said was far less important than that. I think Kathleen wants to answer that, but I want to start down there with Tom because um, one of the things that interested me about that, and don't worry, I'm going to pick on you too, Dan, is that um, you have written a lot about the rise of politics as, as entertainment. 
uh, and this seems to suggest that, in fact, that's correct. Do you, what do you think about this? Well, <clears throat> first, it's important to point out that when a candidate has a scandal, newspapers will cover it. The fact of the matter is, readers, with due apology to, I'm sure, an exceptional audience here, but most readers <laughs> just don't care about policy that deeply. Uh, and so, to some extent, I, and I've written about, you know, blaming the media for giving people exactly what they want, which are interesting stories about, you know, wrongdoing and misdeeds, and the Clinton um, campaign, I think, played uh, right into that. But, it, again, my, my argument all along has been that these stories, uh, I think, were less important than the fact that people had already made up their minds and that they were going to the media, they were going to the te to television or to the New York Times, uh, to confirm things I already believed. And one of the things we went by earlier in this discussion is this, this problem of how the public processes facts. We live in an age, and this is not new. You asked how we got here. I would say for the past 40 or 50 years, we've been living in an era where increasingly feelings are more important than facts. Where people say, well, I just feel that, you know, um, take some of the strangest things I heard during the election, I just feel that Hillary Clinton is... Um, you know, honest and like me. Another guy said, I feel that Donald Trump, a guy in New Hampshire, I just, I just feel that Donald Trump is just one of us. <coughs> he's just like me. And I said, he's the, he's the least like you of anybody on the planet. Um, but they feel, I had somebody during the campaign say to me, what if I feel that unemployment is 42%? <laughs> no, I, I really got asked this. Well, I, I said, it's not. He said, yeah, but it feels that way. I said, who, it doesn't, who cares? <laughs> um, but we are... We are increasingly in this. So I think, you know, we, we can, and I know Kathleen and I agree about this, that that study has a lot of problems of, you know, people counting headlines and the metrics. In the end, you're still making a basic assumption that there was some undecided voter out there who said, I, I'm just so torn between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and I think one more story in the New York Times, really, it's just going to do it for me. It's going to make up my mind. And I don't believe that happened. I don't think, I, I mean, I, I don't think there was really very much thing as an undecided voter. I think there were undeclared voters, which is a different thing. Right. So I, I just don't think it was that powerful. But, but are you saying that, that news doesn't matter? Um, no, because when something big does happen, it does focus our attention. Of course, it's always difficult to figure out when something big happens because every 15 minutes that you come back to the television, it's breaking. Break it. It's happening right now. Oh, my God. Um, but, none, yeah, I think news matters. Um, but the, un, the unending kind of hamster wheel of commentary afterwards, I don't really think, especially in something like a Trump versus Clinton contest where the, where the polarization that Dan's talking about is so stark, um, I don't think there were people who said, well, you know, I started off really thinking I was a Trump guy, but now I'm totally for Hillary Clinton because I just watched... You know, I read a lot of the New York Times this week. I, I just don't think that corresponds with the way people act in the real world. We are political scientists. You know that political scientists believe now that um, people are swayed by news so long as their politicians have not taken a stand on it. The minute it becomes a headline issue, people divide tribally. As long as politicians are not taking a stance, people actually make very well-informed decisions about them, which is interesting. Politicians should apparently stop talking. All right. Um, but but um, but I want to throw I want to <laughs> I want to throw that to Kathleen, and then I have a follow-up question for you about it, Kathleen. What about that study? Walk us through it. Well, first, I just want to make a comment about what it means, what, what you feel like about unemployed. If you're unemployed, 42% probably feels like it's a low number, not a high number. So, I mean, there are times in which sometimes when we listen to people, it's got to be in the context of the lives that they're living. Um, I've been writing about the absence of engaged policy discussion in news since the 1988 campaign. So when somebody does a study that says there's not enough issue engagement in news, I say, really? I'm terribly surprised. We haven't found this before, but this year, actually, I'm less concerned about that than I have been in years past because we have good survey data from across the general election campaign around the debates that suggested that the public was very clear about the issue distinctions between Trump and Clinton. In part, that was because of the high level of redundancy of Trump's claims got given mass access through media channels and Clinton's clear rebuttals to those. So 
When you asked who was going to build the wall, virtually everyone knew. So many people knew that we took it out of the survey because we had a ceiling effect. And as a result, we saw no reason to study it during the debate. I'm well, sorry, what's a ceiling effect? It means that you've hit the highest level that people are likely to ever give you an answer to. So why test before and after a debate when you're in a high 80s already? You're not likely to increment that up. At this point, you have people who are largely at comatose and as a result are outside the media stream who are responding. But there was real clarity on issues from trade and immigration to the wall, et cetera, this year. So that it was found, I believe, I don't doubt that. My problem with the article is that it doesn't clearly define what it means by fake news. It conflates the concept with Russian involvement in the campaign. And we, in general, when we talk about fake news, have not clearly defined the concept. I don't like the phrase fake news because it delegitimizes the word news. I don't think there's such a thing as fake news. If it's fake, it's not news. I will use the word only in quotation marks. I'd prefer to call it imposter news when it literally takes the masthead of a newspaper, the font of a newspaper, the layout of a newspaper, and tries to pretend it is the newspaper as it traffics misinformation. So that kind of identity theft, I'm happy calling imposter news. But much of what people who are legitimate in inquirers about it are talking about is what I would call viral deception, VD, venereal disease. It transmits quickly. You'd like to quarantine it. If you see it, you certainly don't want to catch it. If you catch it, you don't want to give it to anybody. We'd like to eliminate it. Viral deception has this. no source that is clearly identified, or it's an imposter source. It traffics in misinformation, and importantly, when it is caught and corrected, it does not correct. One of the hallmarks of journalism is when it makes a mistake, it corrects. And the stuff that traffics through the viral deception, VD channels, moves among like-minded communities who are disposed to believe it, as a result are uncritical and are not exposed to the counter information, or if they are, less likely to accept it, and that is insidious. So an article that contrasts the coverage that is the substantive issue, coverage with something that is undefined, is not, to me, a useful article. OK, that's a great, th can yes. I, can I just add one other point about the, uh, the critique? Um, Kathleen's right. The, the issue positions um, were well known in this campaign, but I also would argue that this was not a campaign about policy issues. I mean, this was a campaign about fitness for office. This was a campaign about national identity. This was a campaign about resentment toward elites. Th those were the things that were driving people. So, um, you know, we we have been we have been criticized, as Kathleen suggests. We've been criticized through every campaign that I've covered about the lack of policy stories. Um, we have written endless policy stories, and we know that they don't get readers, as Tom suggests. Um, but I, I think in this campaign, um, put that aside, um, people were not making their decision on those, on, on those policy could, choices. Could they have been if there had been greater coverage of issues that were Tom's like, nope, nope, nope. Come on, give me a yes so you two can fight it out. No. 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 So, I mean, it could, uh, what, what would have been elevated um, to become that? And, and the second thing I would say is if, if the two candidates in the, in the dialogue that they are expected to create as candidates don't join those issues in a way, the press isn't going to be able to do it in, in the absence of that. Okay, so this brings up another another point that I want to go back to Kathleen on, and that is that we get the concept of an impartial press during the progressive era in the late 19th century into the 20th century, and the idea is that if the press doesn't present a theory, if the press just gives the facts that informed facts that people will be able to make their own good decisions about them. And this, of course, is a huge problem. It becomes a huge problem, obviously, with McCarthy, who says whatever comes to mind. And by the time that people have fact-checked him, he's on to another story. And we, have, we realize in the 1950s that we have a real problem with this concept of an impartial press because it can be so manipulated. And people learn from McCarthy, and that, art, that business of getting out ahead of the news, telling whatever you want, and then going on to something before anybody can fact check it is a, a, a deeply problematic piece of having a, a journalist that only reports news. But that raises another question that I want to throw back to Kathleen, who studies this. And it's a question that a lot of people have asked, uh, have asked actually, that I ask you. And that is, why is it so hard for pundits to say that people are lying? You know, instead of saying, like, it's, it's fake news or it's, you know, 
whatever you want to call it, why don't you say, dude is lying? Because first, you don't know that someone's lying unless you know they're intentionally deceiving. I'm very worried about normalizing the word lying to tag anything that is misstated or incorrect. It's perfectly possible that someone makes an incorrect statement and they believe it. They are mistaken if they looked at all the evidence carefully, talked to the experts, et cetera. They might come to a different conclusion about the knowable reality. A jury might come to a different conclusion about the knowable reality, but they don't have it. I worry, actually, that we tag people with lying when, in fact, what we're seeing is lack of respect for the evidentiary process, which, for me and a leader, is far more worrisome than lying. If someone's lying, they know the reality and they're deceiving. If they don't know the reality, they're even more dangerous. And so I don't want to use the word lying except when we know there was intentionality. Now, there are times in which we do know there's intentionality. That is, we know that they knew. Seaman on a blue dress, you know that he knew. But under most circumstances, we should not, and I, I worry when a major newspaper conventionalizes the word lying, to attach to every misstatement that person has made, whether deliberate or not, many of which have been made by their candidates and were mistaken when they made it, but are now not tagged as lying. That would be New York Times with its lying page. New York Times, you shouldn't be doing that. You are now taking a concept that needs to have a higher standard of proof, and you're normalizing the lower standard. But if we don't call out things that are obviously untrue, don't we create a, a, a permission for people to go ahead and, and create their own realities? Hey, well, I believe the world is flat. But it's not that people aren't being called out for misstatements. It's, I mean, Kathleen's point is the use of the word lie, as opposed to calling somebody out for saying something that is incorrect, But misstatements and incorrection and things that are incorrect are different than lies. And we've, uh, it, it seems that we have people who are deliberately lying. And we say, oh, another misstatement. The size of an inauguration parade, for example. Perfect. So that's a great, sorry, go ahead. I, I was going to say, that's a perfect example. I mean, when, uh, and I'm, I'm not known for being a big defender of the president, but when the president says, well, you know, it was the biggest inauguration in history, you, you, there's no way for you to know that he consciously knows that's a falsehood. But, or, but, but an observer you can say says, that it's this wrong. is wrong. Yes, you can say that it's, that it's wrong. But again, it's the problem of normalizing the word lie. To say it's a lie, I mean, a lie has a very specific meaning. But isn't the other side of it normalizing falsity? The, I think it's really important that we call out those things that are consequential deceptions. That is, they are deceptive. And that we do it to the extent we can, as close to the moment at which they're articulated as possible. But your question presupposes there's a pundit sitting on a stage, and you have a person who makes a statement, and they're supposed to catch it in real time. And factcheck.org doesn't do that for this reason. Unless we have pre-checked it, and we're very sure that we are right, we do not, in the middle of a debate, call out something because we haven't had time to make sure we've looked at all of the available evidence. We will check it as fast as we responsibly can. Now imagine that someone is sitting on a stage and they hear something, or you're sitting across someone at a table in, in one of these Q&A kinds of exchanges in which people talk over each other on cable news. You've got to be extraordinarily careful that in the speed of that moment you've heard it correctly, you have the context correct, and that you can articulate the alternative in a defensible fashion. I don't think in most cases most pundits are capable of doing that. I don't think most highly skilled academics are capable. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be corrected as quickly as we can. That's why I co-founded factcheck.org. But, but that's, there's a problem within that, and that's that the fact checkers are always behind. It's the same thing that happened to the people who were trying to fact check Ronald Reagan when he ran for, for governor in California, or Joe McCarthy when he was talking about the communists in the State Department. Everyone's paying attention to the lies, and by the time the fact checkers come along, it's old news and no one's paying any attention any longer. That privileges the people who are misstating things. Well, but let's go back to the, the, uh, the question of the crowd size at, at the inauguration. I mean, that was debunked in real time. Um, the, the, Sean Spicer went out into the White House press briefing room the day after the inauguration and made a series of statements, which he will argue at this point were each literally correct. Um, put that aside for a minute. But, but, but the last statement being this, this, this inauguration was seen by more people than any in history. Now, there's no way to disprove that because we don't know how many people watch it overseas. We don't know how many people watch it on social media, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of the size of the crowd on the National Mall, that, that claim 
that it was the equivalent or bigger than Barack Obama's administration, was debunked in real time, which gave rise to uh, uh, Kellyanne Conway's and, comment that, well, there are alternative facts. And, and, by, and by constantly fact-checking these things to the ground, like this problem of seen by, I would argue that the, the media is taking bait that's being thrown at it to overwhelm the fact checkers and the pundits and the media, because as you say, they can't keep up with all of it. So I think a much more useful model is simply to say, okay, the president said it was the biggest inauguration, the press secretary has been seen by more people, here's the fact, move on. And I think that uh, uh, there, there comes a point where the fact checking becomes a form of oppositional behavior itself that then numbs people to, to, to what are actual lies or mistakes. Um, I think Kathleen's point about fact-checking things that are consequential and making sure that when they're corrected, they stick as a correction is far more important than, you know, here's the daily tally of everything that was said that was inaccurate. Because politicians talk, I, I, wrote, I used to work for a politician, I worked in the Senate years ago, I wrote speeches, um, you know, if, if somebody wanted to dog your boss all day long and say, here's all the things you said that are not 100% accurate, you can do it all, all day. Um, now, I actually think that this administration sometimes plays that game intentionally to keep throwing things out to like, you know, like rabbits in front of the greyhounds and just say, chase this falsehood and chase that one um, because then you are ta having those policy uh, discussions. So I, I, I think that this can that become self-defeating. Doesn't that come to the, get to the point where we have no reality any longer? Well, we live in a postmodern world where we don't have reality. I'm, Unfortunately, I'm that's, that I'm is something okay that, that contributes to this. But we, we, we do have realities. And, and so the question is, do we recognize a consequential fact? And are we able on consequential facts to get corrections out there and to stick? And for that, we need to have a theory about what constitutes a consequential fact. I don't think the size of the inaugural crowd is a consequential fact. I think the pattern by which someone repeatedly makes those kinds of small statements becomes interesting as a pattern. But a consequential fact is misstating the unemployment rate. Because in governance, you respond differently if the unemployment rate is 42% as opposed to if it is 4%. And as a result, if you actually get it wrong, the policy implication of getting it wrong is you have the wrong policy response. And as a result, you could actually hurt a situation you were trying to help. And so I think we, we need to be able to say, this one really matters. This one, yes, we're going to check, but it's not the one we're going to spend all of our time trying to make stick. But let me go back for a second. If that matters in policy, if you are permitting people to get away with falsehoods or misstatements or however you want to turn them other than lies, I see your distinction there. Doesn't that simply feed what Tom is talking about, the tribalism that's driving America, and that Dan's talking about, the tribalism that's driving American politics, which is, after all, why the Enlightenment argued for reasoned argument based in facts to begin with. If you let facts go, you have really no options well, I, but try I was only partly kidding when I said we live in this kind of postmodern world where facts are negotiable. They shouldn't be, and I think what used to stop this, you, you asked at the very outset, and I think we all dodged the question a little bit about why is this happening now. Um, the, the speed break on this used to be at least some agreement between people who differed about politics on basic rules of evidence and basic norms of argument. That you couldn't just make stuff up in the middle of an argument and pass it by. You could try, you could, you know, I mean, as, as Dan says, as long as different candidates, this has been happening. What's different now, I think, is we're really seeing the end result of years and years and years are, you know, facts whatever I, are whatever I think they are. And that, I think, is a much, that, I don't lay that on the media. Mm -hmm. I lay that on years of people becoming accustomed to thinking that way because it's convenient to them to, to think that way. Because I think of the what other, I think the other, I think another point related to that is that um, when you say there isn't, there isn't a reality, uh, there isn't an, an agreed upon reality across society at this point. There are different, people have different realities, different sense of what reality is. Let me give you a benign example. Um, this, this happened to me years ago. Uh, it was probably the 92 campaign. And I had written about something that had been on C-SPAN. And I had done what I thought was the, you know, the traditional straight story about this event. And I got an email from someone in upstate New York. And this person said to me, I watched that same event. And here is, the, here is what I saw. Now, um, what, what that person saw was also correct, 
um, but he put a different emphasis on things than I had. So, but you both agree the event happened. Well, yes, we do. <laughs> I mean, th I mean, this is what historians are well, all over no, this. Perspectives matter. But, 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 but that I mean, you're you're taking it to a different level if you're t saying, well, people are talking about events that didn't happen. I'm talking about things that do happen, but they are news organizations, there are enough news organizations now defined as broadly as you want to define that. There are enough information sources that will put emphasis on different things. They will, they will, they will raise up issues in one place that aren't raised up in another. Uh, they will put a spin on events in one form that others are not. So people, people can get the reality that they want or they can create the reality out of the information sources they want. So the idea that there's not an agreed upon reality, I think, is correct. The idea that um, that um, there isn't reality, I disagree with. I think there are realities. So we're going here to the idea of tribalism that has its own version of reality, and that both of those, to some degree, are legitimate. Is that can can I can I can I make that argument? Because I want to go somewhere with it. Yeah. Are you let, with me, with me let, so let far? Me, let me add two quick points. The Academy played a role in creating a relativistic environment when whole blocks of scholars for a decade and a half said everything is perspectival. And we created a whole lot of undergraduates who went into a whole lot of positions in which they were less trusting of institutional sources of authority, sometimes legitimately, and of the capacity to know. And we're very comfortable saying it's really just a matter of perspective and it's actually all about power. And the question is, where is your standing in relationship to it? And they pick that vocabulary up and it tends to destabilize our sense that there is a knowable. Those people who think that we always know the thing as it is, by the way, are living in a really unusual philosophical world, one that's been discredited for about 2,300 years. So the fact that we don't know the thing as it is, but we are putting our perspective on it as we apprehend it, means there's always going to be some disconnect. What we are about is trying to find the best available methods to know what can be known in a systematic fashion that is transparent. And that's why we have institutions such as the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which works out methods through a rigorous process and improves them across time and then tries to use those to set definitions that it tracks across time so that we can say by this measure, the unemployment rate measured this way is this. And since that measure is constant across time, it's changing in these ways. Now what policy would be driven out of that is for the political arena to, as to assess. Factcheck.org has a category called sources we trust. And it essentially says there are places we will go to get reliable expert information. And here's my second point. The first is the academy did its part in destabilizing the sense that there is the knowable. We are also now seeing systematic attacks on those institutions that were set up to be custodians of what we can know. And so to the extent that we say, well, I don't trust the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there isn't something else there other than personal feeling and personal extrapolated experience. And those kinds of attacks on things like the GAO and the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the data gathering process by which NASA comes to know about the climate mean that we no longer have something we once could presuppose, which is a world of expert opinion reasonably gotten and refined over time that could tell us what the premises are from which we can act. If you challenge the first premise, you upend the argument. If you challenge the evidence as evidence, you cannot have an argument. And that's what we're actually moving to in this world in which we won't grant expert opinion its capacity to know. Perfect. <laughs> And that brings up this next piece. In this, in 2017, are we looking at a new moment where we not only have news that is, is now, I, now I don't dare say fake news, um, um, DV news, VD news, sorry. Um, uh, DVD news. Yeah, exactly, that's where I was. Um, but where, where news or lack thereof is, is being weaponized that is, the lack of news is, um, is or uh, the use of, I'm sorry, fake news, is a way to, for the administration and people who are in that tribe to push an agenda that is not, um, that, that is purely a tribal agenda rather than one based in reality. So for example, today we had Sarah Huckabee Sanders saying that journalists were pushing, as she said, fake news for their own agendas. Um, and you have increasingly the president saying that anybody pursuing any kind of investigation with regards to Russia is somehow 
peddling in fake news. So we have not only, we have my version of news, we have me using your version of news against you as, as if you are an enemy. This seems to me to be a new moment. What do you think? Well, it's inoculation. Well, I, actually, after what Kathleen said, I'm afraid to touch my DVR. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, it, it's... Only touch it with its consent. With, uh, um, <laughs> But it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's an attempt to, the, the incantation of fake news is now a political weapon to, to basically fireproof the electorate against having to believe anything that's inconvenient to them, that they don't like. And this is new. Well, it's, I, I, think, it's, I think it's new because it's the first, I'll agree with that it's new to this extent because when you say new, I think back to yellow journalism and Hearst mm -hmm. and, you know, there, I mean, there's not a lot that's new. What's different this time, I think, is that you have political leaders going all the way up to the White House, um, mobilizing this in a way that they never have before. I think that, you know, even going all the way back to Nixon, remember, you know, this attack on the media is itself isn't new. Spiro Agnew, you know, nattering nabobs of negativism, um, but and people, I'm old enough to remember people driving around with bumper stickers that said, "I don't believe the New York Times." Um, on the other hand, this blanket, as Kathleen's talking about, and as I've written about at length, this blanket attack on all sources of knowledge is really a way of kind of, um, kind of vacuum sealing the viewer into, into his or her own world uh, pre pre uh, proactively. So that any time from now on, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, fake news. NASA, fake news. Um, I just, you know, I found a barrel of money sitting, you know, behind the white house. Fake news. Um, it becomes a kind of rabbit's foot that you clutch when you hear something that makes you uncomfortable. And I think what's new is I've never, at least in my lifetime, I've never seen it pushed from the press secretary's office and from the highest levels of government to this extent. Dan, what do you think? I agree with that. I think that, the, I think that you know, as Tom said, politicians have run against the elite media for a long time. I mean, think, think about George Wallace, the way he campaigned uh, when he ran for president. Uh, he would, you know, he would point out the New York Times reporter or the Washington Post reporter. Um, and that has, been a, that has been a favored tactic of many politicians over, over time. What is different is that it is now coming from the President of the United States on a very regular basis. I mean, it is, it is part of the stock and trade of his approach uh, to delegitimize any effort on the part of mainstream media or whatever you want to call it, uh, to do the kind of journalism that we have done f for a long, long time. Um, we have not changed our approach. We have not changed our standards. Um, if anything, our standards are probably higher today because, because the consequences of being wrong uh, are, are more serious today than they were. Um, and, but, you know, as, as uh, some Republican politicians have, have said, uh, fake news is not, is not an article that you don't like. Um, it is, you know, it is, as Kathleen said, something that is more insidious and systematic uh, in, in an effort to try to, you know, put something into the body politic or into the, the political bloodstream. Um, but, um, the, the idea that any, anything that the mainstream media reports that is disliked by this administration or by one party or the other, but particularly the, the Republicans right now, um, that, that they can go after that and, and create any sense of doubt uh, has clearly taken root. I mean, there's almost half the country now that, that does not believe um, much of what the media reports. So we, we are in a different place, and I think it's a much more worrisome place. Uh, you, could, you could kind of dismiss what had happened in the past because it was not at the presidency, it was during a campaign, it was a politician, um, but even if that politician had used it in the campaign, if they won, it was not carried into, uh, into governing. Um, so the idea that we're now doing it as part of the governing process um, is a big change. So looking forward, if in fact we are in danger of delegitimizing the media and other areas of expertise, primarily those within the government, the um, General Accounting Office, for example, like you mentioned, Kathleen, or, the, or NASA, or uh, the Labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics, or any of the other governmental places where we are accustomed to looking for evidence, 
And, and of course, also the Russia investigation, um, which seems to bring out the most accusations of fake news. Um, where, what are we looking at? What do you people think we're looking at in the next two years? Or you can take a different time period if you'd like. And you're all looking at the ground. I, That's not, they're I'm, all looking I don't, at I don't know about the I don't know about the next two years, but in a longer term than that, I'm worried about the end of the republic. I mean, I'm really genuinely afraid talk because us through that. when you because when you combine this kind of approach, this this constant infusion of cynicism, the other half of it that we haven't really talked about that is that makes this so incredibly dangerous is the low level of political literacy and the staggering ignorance of the public <laughs> about most things. Uh, when you have people out there saying, "Listen, I want my representatives to go to Washington and repeal Obamacare." but I want them to keep the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> where do you go from there? Uh, and, and that, you, you get to a situation where when you combine this in, immense amount of cynicism with this immense amount of ignorance, you can, you can do anything. You can accomplish almost anything. You, tell the you can tell people the moon's made of green cheese. I mean, we're almost there, right? We're back to a flat earth society. We still have, we have people on the internet you know, going back to that the moon landing was faked. Um, it's, it shouldn't surprise us that that's possible. And when all of those things become possible and people have almost no political literacy, you cannot sustain the practices that sustain a democratic republic. Okay, it's fair to point out that the U.S. was founded on, um, on the concepts of the Enlightenment, the idea that you had to have facts and you had to have reasoned argument about them in order to make a government that was doing the best for the most people. What do you think we're, where do you think we're going, Kathleen? Uh, I want to say something positive because this is just too depressing for me to leave here <laughs> and then think that I'm going to go to sleep tonight. Um, the People are not inevitably in their partisan space. People are put in partisan space. Most of the time, most of us are not walking around thinking in partisan terms. We are living our lives. We are doing our jobs. We're taking care of our families. We are doing the best that we can in our communities. We're doing you know, sometimes well and sometimes poorly, but most of the time, we're not walking around being ideologues. The question is, how did we get a world in which we are spending proportionally more of our time there than we once were? And how do we get people out of that space into their more analytic space when we need consequential decisions made? We did an experiment that I love, and so I'm going to tell you about it briefly. Um, Arctic sea ice recovered one year. That is, it went way up, somewhat unexpectedly, but within the normal range that you would expect. Arctic sea ice is one of the signals of climate change. It was convenient for those on the right to say recovery no problem, and one news outlet put up the pictures from the year before and the year after. The year before had been a historic low, the recovery year was an historic high within that range, and so it basically implied problem solved. We took those two images in the beginning of that story and we created a controlled experiment in which we showed it to liberals, moderates, and conservatives. Surprisingly, both liberals, moderates, and conservatives were more likely to think the problem had been solved. It was less of a problem as a result of exposure because of what's called endpoint bias. You overestimate the most recent thing you see in a trend line. So the ideological bias of conservatives who are disposed against some climate inferences was being compounded by a human bias, but everybody was experiencing it. Now, here's the good news. We showed people the full trend line. There's only data from 79 through the present because the satellites went up the track Arctic CS in 79. So when I show you all of it, you're not going to say, she's playing games. There's some data she's suppressing. We attributed the data to NASA, which is the source of the satellite data. And NASA retains credibility. And, and we, in a neutral voice, asked people, a series of questions about the trend line that we iterated for them. We started in 79, and we showed them how it went up and it went down and it went up, and it, kept, it went up and it went down. It didn't just always go down, because we're trying to show them what a trend line is within natural variability. And we asked them a series of questions. Was this year higher than this year? Was this year higher than this year? Were the last six years the lowest years anywhere on the line? After they answered those questions, we asked them a series of questions about climate change. and. Our liberals, mo liberals, moderates, and conservatives moved toward the inference that those two pieces of information they'd been given were selective. And as a result, they went back to the baseline level before exposure. What does that mean? It's possible if evidence is presented carefully in a neutral voice and people are driven into their partisan enclaves that the analytic person who asks questions of the evidence will draw an appropriate inference. 
We all do it in medicine when we get a diagnosis. You're told you have cancer. You don't go to Rachel Maddow and Rush Limbaugh to ask what to do. Well, well but let's, let's turn now. If that's the case, how do we get it in front of people? Dan, how do you think we're going? Well, I, I mean, I, I just can't imagine cable news knowing what to do with what Kathleen just talked about. Mm -hmm. In other words, putting that kind of study before an audience and getting six people in, a bo in different boxes to comment on it, right? I mean, but, but you could put the iterative graphics on your web page, Washington Post, and ask people to ask themselves those questions because you've got digital capacity. We do have digital capacity, uh, just as we have print capacity. Um, but we, we have 20 or 40 or 60 or 80 other things that we have to do. Um, but then you come back to my consequential facts. And if you believe climate change is a really important area and information that is accurate is really important, maybe you prioritize getting that iterative graphic on your web page. Well, what do you do, what do, you do when the public has already been prepared ahead of time by political authorities to say, whatever's in the Washington Post is fake? That's the bigger problem. I mean, I, I had this discussion with someone who said, well, where should I get my news? And I said, well, I'm an old Washington guy. I'm, I'm not saying this because Dan's here. Washington Post happens to be my favorite newspaper. I start the day with the Post. And the, just the, like I did when I worked in DC. And they said, well, I'm not reading that. That's the swamp. That's inside the beltway. I said, OK, well, the New York Times is the paper of record. Well, that's just a bunch of New York elites. I'm not reading that. I said, how about the Wall Street Journal? It's capitalists. And I finally I said, OK, you're not really asking me where to get news. You're trying to get me to approve of where you're getting your news. Where are you getting? Well, you know, I search. I find things on the internet. And of course, we all know what that leads to. And, it's, and, it, and that, that, to me, is the problem. I, 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 when you were describing that experiment, I felt the way Dan did, which is, wow, you know, this is like the old joke of walk this way. Well, if I could walk that way, you know, get, if people would just read that, you know, but they, but they won't. Uh, and so I think that's the bigger problem. Um, I, I guess so I, I just want to be depressing now that you've tried to be optimistic. Yeah. I, I, I put it on the NASA site <laughs> and urge people to go to the NASA site because it right. still has credibility. I, I don't want to be as apocalyptic as Tom. Um, and, and I won't be, um, though I do have concerns about the degree to which we are, we are pulling apart and delegitimizing not just news organizations, but all the kinds of things we've been talking about here tonight. The Congressional Budget Office, you, know, you, you name it, and, and people who don't like what they are doing uh, will attack it as being inaccurate or that they didn't do it in the right way. Um, I, I, you know, we do have one mechanism for correcting some of these things, and it's, the, it's elections. And I think that we should watch what happens in Alabama tomorrow. Um, if, if Jones were to win that race, I'm not predicting that he will, but if Jones were to win that race, that will send a message to people, and it will send a message to Republicans in particular. Uh, the, the, the midterms will send another message as to where the country, uh, where they, people are, and what they think about the current presidency and, and uh, the party that's in power. Um, you, know, we, we are, you know, we are tribal in these things, but things can begin to move. And um, if people register objection with the direction that a party in power is moving, uh, politicians who are nothing if not risk averse uh, will begin to act somewhat differently. I mean, there's been a question about at what point will Republican Republican leaders begin to pull, a, pull away from Donald Trump. Um, it's extraordinarily difficult, if you're a member of the Republican Party right now, to go against the president. Um, you know, he is, he is more popular by far among Republican voters than Mitch McConnell or Paul Ryan or you name, you name it, um, Jeff Flake or Bob Corker or people like that. Um, and so uh, for now, there's, you know, there's a, there's a bargain that's been made between the Republicans who did not want Trump to be their nominee uh, and the president that they, that they now have who leads their party. Uh, that is that uh, they are going to be able, they hope, to get some things done that they've wanted to do for a long time. We'll see whether they get the tax bill through or not. Um, but that's, that's an article of faith for people in the Republican Party. Um, and the degree to which Trump can be helpful on that, they're going to stick with him. Um, but um, there are questions about the Russia investigation. There are questions, obviously, about the way the president, uh, you know, behaves, the things he says, the things he does that concern a lot of Republicans who are not yet ready 
to break in a public way in the way that somebody like Flake or Corker has done. Um, the degree to which the public suggests or, or uh, kind of uh, facilitates that movement is something that we need to be watching over the next 18 months and, and as we head to 2020. Well, I will point out that nobody wakes up in the morning and says, please lie to me. And one of the things that is interesting about this moment right now is that a lot of the, the stories that people have come to believe in their tribes are being proven to be completely inaccurate. And the rubber is meeting the road, and a lot of people are deciding, after all, they like Obamacare, for example, and they don't want a tax cut if it looks like this. And that might give us a little bit more hope than the kind that Kathleen is thinking of. But on a more practical level, before we turn to audience questions, I wonder if you can, the three of you, um, can, can give us some marching orders or some ways to respond to people in our lives, for example, who live in bubbles, how to suggest to them that maybe they should, it's not good for them to be looking at only a single source of news, or perhaps what is a good strategy to operate against sort of anti-intellectualism, anti-expertise anti moment we're in, or even how to counter the moral equivalency, what aboutism stuff we see all the time. How would you say to people who are not in this for work, uh, how do you deal with Christmas dinner? Very small group. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, here's what I would say about that. Um, in one form or another, we're all in bubbles. Um, and I, I think that one of the things uh, that's important is to try to understand better why people do think differently than we do, uh, however, however you think, uh, whether you're pro-Trump or, or anti-Trump. Why is it that people who are on the other side are, are the way they are? Um, there's, a, there's a professor at the University of Wisconsin named Kathy Kramer who did a book called The Politics of Resentment. And she was at a conference after the election a year ago. Um, and um, when, the, when the audience got their chance to ask questions, somebody in the audience said, well, what should we as Democrats say to these voters? And it was, it was talking about white working class voters. And, and uh, Professor Kramer's response was, well, the first thing you should do is listen to them. Um, and I think that that's part of what we've lost. Um, is this ability to try to not to agree necessarily with the people who we disagree with, but to try to get a better sense of why we are as separate as we are. Why, why do people see the world in a different way? Um, and I think out of that, you can then begin to have a conversation of the kind you're talking about, which is, you know, well, point to the things that, that, that you know, that I as a, you know, as a newspaper journalist at the Washington Post feel are fact-based sources of information uh, and, how to, and how to seek those out and how, to, you know, and how to draw your conclusions from those. I want to go to Tom next because I want to end on a positive note. <laughs> uh, well, you've been, you've been hoping Dan and I or would disagree about something earlier, uh, so I, I'll disagree now. Um, I think it is the, the and I, you know, as an as a ex expert or scholar, I look at this differently than a journalist. I think journalists do have to go out there and listen to people and tell their stories. That's, that's what that's how the rest of us learn things. Um, but I have become much more um, inflexible about arguing over reality. Uh, that I think on the advice I've given to experts and what I've written in my book is experts need to plant a flag in the ground and stop, uh, stop having conversations that, you know, I think unemployment is 42%. Well, that's interesting. Tell me why that is. I think you should start by saying, okay, that's wrong. It's just wrong. I'm, I'm here to tell you that I actually know more about this than you do, and we're not going to have a discussion about the nature of factual, you know, empirical reality. Um, because I think too much of what's happened is um, listening uh, in that sense. You know, a lot of times uh, audiences will say, you know, we, we voted this way or we're angry this way because Washington doesn't listen to us. And I always come back with the same thing. It doesn't go over very well sometimes when I say, actually, the problem with our politics is Washington listens to you too much and tries to do exactly what you're telling it to do, even though what you're telling it to do is completely incoherent. <laughs> and, and that instead, I think that experts and people who know how to look at pictures from space need to, to say, look, I'm not going to start on the assumption that we both are 50% possibly right on this. I'm going to start by saying I know about Arctic ice, and if you believe it's not declining, you are wrong. 
And I think that that is a really important position. Now, it's not one I would suggest for journalists to take. Obviously, a journalist, you know, it's not a good interview to start by saying, good morning, you're wrong about everything. Now tell me what you think. <laughs> but I think for experts I engaging with the public, I think experts have to get back out and get back into the game and, pl and plant some flags about what's true and what's false and what's real and what's not real. And I think we're, t we're, not, we're hesitant to do that. Well, I think journalism can do both of those things. Uh, I mean, I, I think good journalism uh, not only uh, points to what, what experts say and, and the degree to which those findings are credible and defends that kind of thing. At the same time, you know, I mean, one of, the, one, of the, one of the criticisms of the press was, well, why did the press not see Donald Trump coming, right? Um, why, why, did, why was everybody so wrong in suggesting that Hillary Clinton was going to be the, 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 the president? Um, and part, I think that's a question that we all ask ourselves afterwards. What, what, did we, what, what did we underestimate? It's not that we didn't know there was anger or disgust with Washington or uh, you know, a, a, a lack of belief in, in expertise or politicians. Um, but why did, why did we not recognize the degree to which it could push the election the way it did? Um, so that's something that we have to constantly be out trying to figure out. What, you know, what's actually going on in this country? So uh, can, can I just put in a plug here, and he didn't pay me to say this, I never met him till tonight, Radio Free Tom on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but let's end this part of this evening with your advice, Kathleen, about what people can do to, to, to push back against this moment and create a new moment in America. First, just a quick comment. If journalists spent less time talking about horse race, they would have to feel less guilt about having gotten it wrong because they wouldn't have been spending as much time on horse race. Uh, but I, I would take a different tact. I don't think we want experts to simply assert their expertise. I think we want them to explain how it is they know what they know and then tell us what they know as a result. And so we, we, we've got to put back in place a public understanding of why it is important that we know some things because we have to know some things in common in order to act. And we want to know reliably. And we have worked out structures that we think are reliable means of generating that knowledge. We haven't done a very good job of explaining why it is we believe that they are reliable, what it is that we have in place to protect the reliability of the knowledge. And the absence of that, it is easier to just simply say, oh, you're an elite expert. I'm going to dismiss you because you're saying something inconvenient. It's harder when someone has grounded it in an understanding of how we came to know. And so that would be the one change that I would make. I'd spend a little more time. It's the reason factcheck.org doesn't do the conclusory statements and doesn't do Pinocchio's apologies to the Washington Post and doesn't have a truth -a meter apologies to PolitiFact because that's a kind of move that gives you the conclusion and invites you to stop there instead of, re of going through the process of understanding how we got to it. And it's too convenient to just have those things and as a result use them as if the voice of God has just spoken, but you don't know why. On that well, note, but, but, we, but the Pinocchio has come after. I know. At, at the end of the. This is, of, a, of this is a good time then, then to open it up to questions for our panelists. We have a. a I'm afraid the lights are in my eyes. I think there's somebody. Oh, there we go. There's my name is here. Ray Mack, and I'm from West Bridgewater. And it's a very simple question, I believe. If you take, like most of you have seen today, the White House press um, the White House press conference with Sarah Huckabee. Um, the question I would ask all three of you is, what do you think the response of the press corps should be at the, president, at the White House press conference? Should they get up and just walk out and say, we won't take any more of this? Or should they stay there and fight and fight? Dan, why don't we throw that one to you? Well, they should stay there. I mean, the, we have, we have six or seven people who are assigned to cover this White House. Uh, and their job is to find out everything they can about what's going on in the White House. And one of the things that at least one of the reporters every day has to do is go to that briefing um, and ask the questions that they are able to ask and to try to probe. And um, you know, often the answers are not particularly satisfactory. But I don't think standing up and walking away uh, is, is any solution to anything. Over here. Okay, so 
My question to Professor uh, Tom Nichols. Um, I wonder what's your opinion on religion? Of what? I'm sorry? On religion. I, religion? Yeah. Um, so, like what's, yeah, so uh, how can an uh, expert with no religion have a helpful conversation with his friend who is a strong, too strong religious belief? Oh, that's a great question. My oh. experience is like this. When I talk about a serious topic like climate change, uh, revolution, I always give my friends a whole story with many sides, like theories, assumptions, and evidence, and doubts, and open study. However, they always took a very interesting appro uh, approach, basically just grab part of my information and combine with their belief, then use it against me. And uh, well, some, that's, some, a, my, yeah. that's a great question. My, my, Sometimes, I just want to say, it becomes even harder to stay on the same topic because we just consider different fundamental things. So what's your suggestion? My, um, my feeling about religion is I'm generally a fan. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a religious man myself. Um, but I, I'm, I'm a product of uh, the Western Enlightenment, as you know, we were talking about earlier. I mean, I don't think there's any, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time in the tension between reason and revelation. I, uh, and uh, I think if, you know, you say, why are leaves green? You can answer that both ways. You say, well, because there's this thing called chlorophyll and science knows. You can also say, well, I believe in God and God wanted green leaves. You don't have to argue about that. You can still talk about the science. Now, I think when someone says, Look, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna accept anything you say because I get all my knowledge from Revelation. Then I think you politely disengage and you say, um, I respect your beliefs, but you know, that's that's not the way I do critical inquiry. Um, and I think we also, one place where I think discussion between Americans in general has become difficult, and particularly between people of faith and people uh, for whom faith is not what drives their politics is we constantly confuse normative and empirical questions. We're constantly confusing what is with what we think ought to be. Uh, what's true with what we want to be the truth or, or want to have happen as a matter of policy. Um, in the book, one of the, and my, my students will tell you, I hate the expression with a passion, uh, let's agree to disagree. I hate that expression. You know, it's just a way of, it's how people paint themselves into a corner and then can't get out of it, and they say, well, let's agree to disagree. I think when you talk about religion, it's okay to say, let's agree to disagree. <laughs> I think it's the one place to say, you know, if you believe that this is a policy that, you know, you're a believer and I'm not a believer and we disagree about what this policy ought to be, at some point you really are disagreeing about whether, you know, vanilla is better than chocolate. You're, you're having a moral disagreement. That doesn't mean... I don't think, and I, I, it has not been my experience that with, with most people of faith that you can't have a rational conversation about science and facts and things that really exist. It's when you get into the normative questions where the distance starts to open up, and that may just be a point where you say, okay, we're going to have to choose to see this differently. But it's a, he's, he's got a good point. It's a huge problem right now in places like Alabama and tomorrow's election. Well, I think I think one of the one of the where reality is hinging on religion. I mean, uh, Kathleen brought up. Um, the academy, and I think you know the right wants to blame the left, and the left wants to blame the right. I think there is definitely you um, know there is a strain of Protestantism in America that says, you know, the Bible is revealed truth, and the earth is you know at six thousand years old, and that's just the way it is. Just as in the uh, the postmodern academy, it's well, it's all a matter. The earth is as old as you think it is because it's all a matter of perspective. Most people are not on those extremes, and you can have a productive discussion somewhere in the middle bet between those two things. Over here. Uh, hello. Um, the theme of the talk is truth and reality in journalism. Um, so, of course, I went to a Washington Post article, um, which goes through uh, the list of conflicts of political interests between the media and the democratic political infrastructure. Uh, the president of CBS News, David, Ru David Rhodes, is uh, the brother of Obama policy uh, advisor uh, Ben Rhodes. 
Um, ben Sherwood, the president of ABC News, is the brother of the Obama and Biden national security advisor, Liz Sherwood Randall. Ian Cameron, who is the executive producer of ABC this week, is married to Susan Rice. I could go on and on from the Washington Post article of the deep conflicts of interests. Um, so my question is, um, given these uh, deep connections and conflicts of ideological interest, um, and given the history of fake news against Republicans, conservatives, and the new CNN article that can't even get the date right uh, against Donald Trump, uh, why should we believe that the media cares about reality and truth and isn't a system of control and propaganda for the liberal democratic establishment? Thank you I, I very much. I want to throw this one to Kathleen. Because when the media is caught making a mistake, it corrects. As it did with the CNN article immediately. Go ahead. Dan. Well, A, yes. Um, <laughs> and we, I mean, we, had, we had one of our own recently where somebody tweeted out something that turned out not to be right. And within minutes when he would learn about it, he took it down and apologized for it. Um, there has to be a transparency. Um, you know, just because family members are working in an administration or in a news organization doesn't mean they are making decisions on the basis of someone being told what to do. People make their own independent decisions. Uh, you know, the, the Rhodes brothers are both independent and smart people. Um, and David is caring about what CBS News is doing, and Ben was worried about the Obama administration's uh, foreign policy. Uh, and I don't think that you would necessarily say that the CBS coverage of the Obama foreign policy was tilted as pro-Obama the entire way. Um, so I think that you have to look at what, what the news organizations are doing as opposed to thinking about just because there are connections, there's something nefarious about that. There, it's not a propaganda operation. Um, you know, we, we have in, in, in our realm now, in, we have spouses working in potentially conflicting areas. Um, society has figured out how to deal with that. Organizations, businesses or journalism organizations, whatever, have all learned how to deal with that. Um, there is a professionalism that goes along with what we all do. And we, we like to believe that, that, that those professional standards are what guide our decision making and, and the values that we've, you know, that we've followed for a long time. So I think you have to look past the kind of thing you're talking about um, and say, all right, does, does, does the work of news organization A, B, C, or D hold up over time? And I think that's the truest test. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer you from a more sympathetic perspective because I'm a conservative. And for most of my life, I've been a Republican. Whether I still am, I'll let you know in a couple of days. <laughs> I understand where you're coming from. It made me crazy that Ben Rhodes and David Rhodes are brothers. I, I get it. it. It made me crazy that, you know, overall, journal, you know, most people in, in newsrooms aren't like me. Most people in my profession, in academia, aren't like me. Um, okay, stipulated that, you know, people have political views. But I think you really should focus on what Dan just said, because it's the same point I'm going to make. There is such a thing as professionalism. Um, and if you're, going, if you're not going to trust journalists because they are related to certain people or because they're a member of a certain party, then you'd better stop trusting military generals. You'd better stop trusting scientists. You'd better stop trusting teachers. You'd better stop tr trusting your plumber and electric, everybody. Then at that point, uh, you, because what you're assuming, uh, you, Kathleen, you made the comment about people don't get up every morning and say, I'm going to partisan as hard as I can today. People don't do that. Yes, is there, are, is Washington swampy? And are, do people make phone calls that would really make your head explode, be, you know, af, after hours? Yes, welcome to the world of adult politics. It's ugly and it happens. And it happens on both sides. And I think Republicans who are complaining about family relations being an important part of, you know, corruption in the White House really don't have a leg to stand on anymore. <laughs> so, you know, let's accept and let's be, let's, you know, let's, let's accept. I, I, I feel like I say this every time I talk, that we live in a fallen world, okay? We're human beings. We're imperfect. But I have enough faith 
and the professionalism of most of the people I work with, whether it's in the academy or, or military people or scientists or journalists or whoever, and in part because what's one way a profession keeps from going over the edge? Is that they're all watching each other, that, that they're constantly checking on each other. And, and, and I think that's a really important thing. The fact that you hear about all these conflicts of interest, that all of these mistakes are caught, that all these corrections are issued, I think is a sign of health rather than a sign of dysfunction. So you're either going to believe in the division of labor and that we are all capable of doing our best work even when we don't like it, or you're not. But I, I will say that, yes, I, I empathize with your question, because when I was your age, I was voting for Ronald Reagan, who I felt was getting shaft from the media, and 35 years later, I'm still angry about it. <laughs> Over here. Thank you. Uh, my name's uh, Bob Funk, and first off, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. Shows me that good civic Bostonians and Massachusetts people are looking for the truth, and that gives me faith that our democracy is not dead yet. <laughs> Second off, I have a caveat. I have been to all three of your sites. I enjoy them immensely. Uh, Ms. Richardson, much to my chagrin, or actually joy, I also uh, do Boston College. I have to admit, I do WZBC Truth and Justice Radio. So I have a contact with you there. Now, with all of that said, I, tr I have a four-hour show, which is usually from si which is always six to ten on Sunday, and I don't mean that as a plug. <laughs> what I what I'm trying to get to is most people aren't up to listen to this thing on Sunday morning at six o'clock. I ha I fact check everything I do, everything, and I ensure that I get the best out there that I possibly can. On two occasions, I have made errors and have immediately gone back and corrected them. And the, my point is, my point is, why can't, when we catch somebody in a lie, especially number 45, a blatant lie, that somebody doesn't stand up and say, can you please speak the truth? Because if you ever do, you're going to burst into flames because you haven't said anything true yet. Let, let's say, Why let's don't we just call them out on let's, let's throw this one to Dan, <laughs> since I think Kathleen has already answered a version of it. Go ahead, Dan. Why can't people, why can't reporters, for example, just stand up and say, dude, you're, you're lying? Well, on, on, what are the circumstances? Well, it sounds like you're at a, you're at a uh, briefing. Uh, um, Trump saying... I saved $735 billion on the F-35, which is not true because that actually happened under Obama. Well, let's, let's start with the president. The, the, the press gets actually very little access to really do a follow-up question with the president of the United States. He doesn't do that many press conferences. Um, and um, there's very often news of the day that has to be dealt with. Um, so, and I think that when, when he does do something, that's you know completely non-factual. Um, there, there's an effort to follow up to try to pin him down. Um, similarly, at the White House briefing, I mean that the, the White House briefing in this administration is as contentious as any, or, or far more contentious than any I've ever seen. Um, it is a it is a constant battle between the press and and uh, Sarah Sanders uh, about all kinds of things. Um, and a lot of it has to do with things that the president said. And very often, whether it's Sarah Sanders or Sean Spicer before that, uh, they simply would not take the question. You know, if you tried to pin them down on what does the president think about such and such, or why does he say what he says, um, you, couldn't, you could not get an answer. But, there, but the efforts to try to do that uh, are that way. Um, but I think there's, you know, there's also a question of decorum. Um, and if you are a professional journalist and you are dealing with, you know, put aside the president, if you are dealing with a, you know, a responsible elected official uh, in a public setting, um, 
you know, you, you generally do not get into a big argument with them. You try to use your professional techniques uh, to draw attention if you think that they've made a misstatement or that they're completely, you know, lying or however you want to describe it. Um, but you don't, you know, it, it's, it's not the nature of journalists to stand up and, you know, do what a lot of citizens here would like us to do. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I, I think that you give us less credit uh, for this than, than I would suggest that my colleagues who work very hard at this, uh, the efforts that they put in to try to hold people accountable. Over here. I'd add to that that every word that you write and every broadcast word that you speak is a refutation of that, those lies if you're doing your job correctly. Um, my question is about respect. We've um, Respect in my mind leads to learning, knowledge, it leads to progress, compassion. We've elected a man who uh, respects nothing as far as I can tell. What do you think is the number one thing that the American electorate respects at this point in our history? Did you hear that? Wow. It's a great question. Um, I, I can give you the, the, the easy answer. Um, the polling data would suggest there's still high levels of confidence in the Supreme Court and in the U.S. military. But I would say that, uh, that's right, and I, but it worries me. Uh, the, because I never thought uh, I would, you know, and I, uh, again, I don't represent the views of the Navy. I think it's important to say that. Uh, and I have written that I, about this. I find it very disturbing when people say, as you did well, you know, there's a lot of problems with the institution, but thank God there are generals in charge. That, that scares the hell out of me uh, because I think that is not, like that is un-American and anti-small R Republican. Um, and I, but so I'm a little worried that those are the only things that the, that the public uh, seems to respect. My answer to you is, you know, what does the public respect? And uh, the way it, people vote and conduct themselves in public, I think the only my answer always comes down to, well, the only thing they seem to respect is themselves. Uh, that that what's important to them. I think we've lost our civic mindedness and our our thought about our fellow citizens as other people. Uh, that we're ba that basically we care about what happens in the immediate keep out zone around us and our families. So I, I don't know what people really want beyond that. I think I don't, I don't want to be, you know, overly Norman Rockwell about you know the old days of you know the New Hampshire town meeting and all that stuff because I used to live in New Hampshire and those weren't fun. But <laughs> but um, I, I I think that people you know have have lost their civic virtue. And the only institution they really care about is themselves at any given moment. I'm being pessimistic again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dan, I'm going to skip you so we can get on to more questions. Um, over here, please. Well, it's too bad that uh, factcheck.org uh, didn't go back to the 1960 election when JFK used a fake missile gap to help get himself elected. And it was about this time last year that the Washington Post uh, 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 revealed the great scoop uh, that the Russians had hacked the American electrical system through some obscure uh, utility in Vermont. In the last couple of weeks, we've seen a couple of more uh, fake uh, Russian stories that had to be retracted by ABC and CNN. So isn't the media a little too quick, uh, perhaps, uh, to believe misinformation about Russia, perhaps more than any other sp uh, subject, and to spread that disinformation? Haven't uh, journalists become the new McCarthyites? No. Yeah, yeah, I, and I'm, I'm actually going to say. As an expert on Russia, I'll tell you, no. And uh, that the Russians go, did not. With, believe in experts. Did you ask me a question? The Russians did not hack our voting machine. And remember, in Wisconsin, the, re, the recount was done on paper ballots. So unless you believe there were armies of Russian agents swarming the Wisconsin countryside filling out paper ballots, that's not the case. The Russians have, and I've said this repeatedly, they directly attacked our democratic institutions. Including, and including here and those of our allies. There's no doubt about that in my mind. I don't think it succeeded, but they, but they did it. What that said, I don't think that the press is too eager to believe disinformation about Russia. I think, in fact, uh, if we spent more time on Russia, people would actually know how awful things have become there. I think we're actually too easy uh, on the Russians as a normal country this day. But this notion that somehow the Russians are winning this disinformation war, uh, I, I think, you know, they, that, the, trying to lay off the election to this, and I, I love the missile gaps. You're right about the missile gap story. Well, There's no doubt about that. It's, but it's continued since then. They're just but, taking a page out of our book. Now. But, but we've, we've been interfering in elections but, for decades. But I actually think we've addressed that issue with the idea that that 
the mainstream media, one of the definitions that Kathleen gave us was the people who were not the VD media were the ones who, who retracted stories that they discovered were, were not true. And that, I think, is the case, certainly the ones you have mentioned. So let's go over here to this question. Hi, so we have a question from online. Um, a mom whose son is in the audience tonight is a senior and plans to major in communications and journalism. What advice do you have for him? Uh, I'm advice afraid I didn't hear a lot of Advice for it. young journalists? Oh, journalist. oh. oh. Advice for young journalists? Um, read, read everything you can possibly read. Be as curious as you can be. Um, look for people who will show you or teach you how to do good journalism. Um, read the best of journalism. Um, if you can work on a student paper, work on a student paper. Um, if you can um, get a summer job on your local paper, do that. Um, I, you know, I, I, this, is, this, is a very, this is a very challenging time to be a journalist, but it's also a, an extraordinary, uh, exhilarating time to be a journalist. And I think if you are young and aspire to want to um, you know, be a good investigator, um, be a, be a hard-charging and digging reporter, um, there are lots of ways that you can do it, but I think you have to have a belief in what journalism can do, and I think there's probably a greater appreciation of that today than there might have been a few years ago. Um, and I think that what you, what you want to do is try to pursue that um, in, 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 f in finding people who will uh, provide role models and, and mentoring for you to be able to do it. I'd like to take one last question here because we're coming up to the 7.30 mark. Well, thank you. For, uh, for, I first want to thank you very much for an extremely stimulating discussion. Uh, I think Professor Nichols put an idea in my mind in a way I can ask it as a question. Um, we, Everything I've heard tonight seemed to talk about fake news as an empirical distinction between what is true, what is false in terms of how we view reality. I can only accommodate or understand Trump's use of the word and the administration use of the word fake news as a normative rather than empirical. Uh, what is true news is what advances his agenda. What is fake news is what doesn't or inhibits his agenda. So if we take that, uh, it would allow you, for instance, as a comeback in the news periods with uh, Sarah to come back and say, well, now that's fine, but what would the truth be of this statement rather than whether it advances or doesn't advance your agenda. So I don't know, would you want to elaborate a little bit more on that if you agree that Trump's use of fake news is normative rather than empirical? Well, I, as I said earlier, I'll just be brief. I mean, I think the, the problem is the president uses the term fake news to insulate people who hear that term against accepting new information. Uh, and, and basically to replace their, to, to, to displace sources of, unbiased sources of information with whatever comes out of the administration. So I, I, don't, I don't think he's making a normative versus empirical distinction. I think he's simply trying to delegitimize other sources of information other than the political shop. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's a pretty simple, straightforward strategy, unless any other. Well, I agree. <laughs> well, on that note, um, for all the talk of false news and of the death of expertise, I think it's impressive that so many people showed up tonight to talk about this and to, to, to hear what these wonderful people had to say about it. And I'd like to thank you all for coming. It's always a pleasure to have you here. And I want to thank our panelists. Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs>